Captaincy, an honor that's been bestowed for decades to the player that's the best leader. Usually, they're full of character in the room, great teammates, and care deeply about the team's success. However, despite the many men that have worn the sea with dignity, there's been several that have been far from doing so. In this video, we'll be going over some NHL captains that weren't completely deserving of the role for various reasons. We'll first go over their story for context, then dive into why they didn't work out as captains. But before we do that, I'd like to quickly invite you to use my link below if you're interested in buying any Fanatics products. If you'd like to support the channel and also get some of your favorite team's gear, head on over to their site where they're always having massive sales. And with that, here there are four captains who didn't deserve captaincy. Selected second overall by Ottawa in 1992, Alexei Yashin was the first draft pick that the Senators had the pleasure of selecting prior to the team's inaugural campaign. After playing in Russia for a season, Yashin made his way back to Canada's capital, only to learn that he was no longer the only highly touted prospect that the team had. As Alexander Daig, after being taken first overall in 1993, seemed to be the prime focus as far as management was concerned. To prove it, Daig was signed to one of the largest rookie contracts in league history, which was a five-year, $12.25 million deal. However, for Yashin, despite outplaying his teammate in his Calder eligible season with 30 goals and 70 points total, it wasn't enough to get a pay raise. Therefore, after management failed to increase his earnings, which were much less, the forward decided to sit out for most of the 95-96 campaign. And it was after this stunt, per se, that Yashin was surprisingly made captain of the team. Even though he did shine especially for Ottawa in the last two seasons as a Sen, by 1998 Yashin was disgruntled yet again. Following the 1997-98 campaign in which he scored 72 points in 82 games played, Yashin yet again demanded a pay raise from his team. Since the 3.1 million he was set to bring in for the 98-99 season wasn't enough for the forward. He kept lobbying for more. And in response to the stalemate, Yashin eventually requested a trade. This along with other reasons was why the Senators decided to give the C to Daniel Albertson from there. Yashin went even as far as trying to sign a contract to play overseas in Switzerland during the whole dispute, which further damaged his reputation. Really good. We're here today to announce that um that the Senators have suspended Alexei Yashin without pay and at this time has no real reason to expect that uh, he'll report to training camp and really can't predict when or if he'll play. Considering that Yashin seemed to put himself first on multiple occasions, this doesn't scream captain material by any means. He abandoned his team, as I mentioned, and attempted to play for another, while technically still under contract with the Ottawa Senators. The whole turn of events made him seem selfish and entitled from a spectator's standpoint. One of the most controversial captains that's ever done the sea was 1984's eighth selection, Shane Corson. Known as a gritty type of player that readily dropped the gloves, Corson joined the Habs roster officially in 1986. However, during his time in Montreal, Corson found himself knee-deep in controversy. After getting into a dispute with a bartender at a local nightclub, Corson found himself getting suspended from the team. Since this wasn't his first time getting involved in an altercation where alcohol was involved, coach at the time Pat Burns voiced his opinion on the incident. Bars are supposed to be fun, but he turns them into a boxing ring, Burns said. And it wasn't long after he was suspended by his own team that Corson found himself being traded to Edmonton. Following the days of Wayne Gretzky and Marc Messier, by 1992, the Oilers were far from being the dynasty they once were. However, the following year, Edmonton was awarded the seventh overall selection, and with it, they selected Jason Arnitz. Corson, who was tasked with mentoring Arnitz, was promoted to captain by the time the 94-95 campaign commenced. And even though that particular season was shortened due to a lockout, it was enough time for Corson to burn some more bridges. According to multiple sources, Corson got in an altercation with Arnitz in the locker room after the 20-year-old rookie received an assist point. Corson, who believed he was more deserving than his teammate for the point, lashed out at Arnett in result. Well, this among other things was enough for head coach George Burnett 
to strip his captain of his seat in the end. Burnett, who was originally the one who appointed Corson as captain, was fired the next day by GM at the time, Glenn Sather. Corson would go on to continue creating controversy even after he was traded elsewhere. By the time he arrived in Vancouver, Marc Messier had captured a slew of esteemed accolades that set him apart. After receiving two Ted Lindsay and Hart trophies along with six Stanley Cup rings among other things, Messier, in the latter stages of his career, decided to play in BC. However, along with promises to take the team to new heights, came various demands that would in turn disrupt team chemistry and enrage the fan base. Firstly, after signing his lucrative contract, Messier decided he was going to wear number 11, despite the fact that it was previously retired. And to make matters worse, even though the number was unofficially retired, it belonged to Wayne Mackey, a player who was memorialized in this way due to dying tragically from brain cancer after just playing two seasons with the team. And despite the protests coming from the late Mackey's family members, Messier decided to wear number 11 anyways. After receiving the number he wanted, Messier went to work in pursuit of captaincy, a duty that had been given to Trevor Linden even before thoughts of Messier wearing a Vancouver jersey were even thought of. According to multiple sources, Linden felt that Messier's abrupt invasion of the dressing room was rather hostile. After apparent friction became evident between the two, Linden was then shipped off to Long Island to play for the Islanders. While it is, and has been, a tendency for some teams to appoint the best player on the team as captain, it's not always the best route. As it seemed like Messier felt that, since he had the pedigree, he deserved to march in and take the sea. Besides the fact that he wasn't sensitive to the Wayne Mackey situation, this further solidified the case that he wasn't the best choice for captain. And I think his behavior later on substantiated just that. After Messier found himself being bought out due to underperforming, he decided to sue the Canucks for around $6 million in result. Another great quality for a captain to have is simply being humble and not arrogant. And even before he put a Sabres jersey over his head, Jack Eichel began demonstrating that he wasn't humble in the slightest. The 2015 NHL entry draft was definitely a fun one. On one hand, there was Connor McDavid who blew everyone out of the water with his speed and quick hands. McDavid was definitely what you'd expect from a Canadian phenom. Similarly to Sidney Crosby before him, McDavid was far from boasting about his talents and seemed to defer to a team first mentality. And on the other side of the spectrum, there was Jack Eichel, an exciting player to watch in his own right. Eichel blew into BU with a knack for scoring. While using his size to his advantage, Eichel displayed power and strength that allowed him to protect the puck with ease. Despite the fact that he was ranked second going into the draft, Eichel gave prospective suitors the assurance that he would be better than McDavid in the long run and that he should be their prime target instead. Sabres GM at the time, Tim Murray, confirmed what reports conveyed by saying, quote, he said that, I think he should say that, why not say that? I think he believes it, end quote. Starting off, this is how we got acquainted with Jack Eichel. After the Sabres selected him, he almost seemed to play on their desperation. Since the Sabres were in shambles for years, under mediocre ownership and leadership in general, the team and fans were overjoyed that Eichel had finally arrived. And by the time Eichel turned 21, the Sabres had decided to make him their 19th captain in franchise history. This was also shortly after he was given a hefty $80 million extension. Besides his ego, Eichel also seemed to not be able to handle losing as well as other players could. Good, meaning that he was constantly expressing his frustration outwardly in a way that wasn't helpful for teammates and fans at all considering. And since there's plenty of more stories, sources, and parts to the Eichel saga that I'm not going to be touching on here, if you're interested in learning more, check out this video I did about Eichel's past in particular. But in a nutshell, a former NHL player himself, Craig Reve, who also played for the Sabres, gave us a taste of how Buffalo feels about Eichel. On his podcast, After the Whistle, he produces with Andrew Peters, Reve gave his thoughts about the former captain. There's a lot of people in the city that I know inside the organization and the way that Jack presented himself. Let's put aside the captain thing. Let's talk about the person. The way he treated people around the rink, in the dressing room, around the city was not a positive thing. There's no class in this kid, Reve said. 
As most of us know, what Reve was referring to was when the Sabres decided to strip him of his captaincy after he failed his physical in 2021.